This week on Information Technology Leaders, Steve Jarvis, Staff Vice President of E-Commerce at Alaska Airlines. Now, here's your host, Laura Schildkraut. Today's guest is the Staff Vice President of E-Commerce for Alaska Airlines. In addition to being a trusted and trusting leader, he is a realist who can see the potential for corporate success or failure before it becomes evident to others, and he makes his career moves accordingly. He approaches his career with the same sense of vision that has made his project successful, and his career path demonstrates that rare balance of making rational and calculated moves with the wings of a risk taker. As we talk through his professional life, you'll notice that each next step is truly the sum of the parts of experiences attained in a combination of all his previous positions. But those moves are neither safe nor obvious. However, you can't deliver on your vision and desire without talent. Luckily, he has all three. Please welcome Steve Jarvis. Where did you grow up? I'm a native Seattleite. Are you? I describe myself as an arrogant Seattleite. An I, arrogant Seattleite. I can't imagine anybody would want to live anywhere else. <laughs> I feel the same way. I feel so, so lucky to be out here. Just, yeah. It's never gone away. So what was it like being raised by two therapists? Um, well, a lot of people ask me if I was, you know, analyzed uh, when I was growing up, and you know, I might have been, but I sure couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad is a is a psychiatrist, and you know, he would come home from work every day and find a way to do something that I struggle to do sometimes, and that's leave it all at work. Mm. Um, so, I'm sure that they were watching me pretty closely, making sure I tripped over the right boundaries and, and learned mm -hmm. from that. But uh, I didn't feel like mm -hmm. I was overly analyzed mm -hmm. growing up. I, I have a lot of respect for my dad in that way. I think all kids are overly analyzed growing up, unless you've got too many of them where you can't take notice, but right. it's just a matter, I guess, of whether or not it shows. Right. And what were you like in high school? Well, I, I was a nerd. I'd say I was a nerd with good connections. <laughs> what um, does that mean? Well, I, I had a good, good sports uh, uh, connections with sort of the popular crowd, but you know, was in the accelerated programs, the advanced placement programs. I was an avid skier growing up, and I kind of mm -hmm. hung out with uh, the rat pack of skiers that I that I played with on the weekends. Um, you know, I played tennis in high school, but you know, I'm, I'm all of five foot six, so I wasn't first on the basketball mm -hmm. or football coaches <laughs> list to recruit. Uh, but I did enjoy playing those sports in the rec mm -hmm. leagues. Um, so I'd say I was I was studious, but also you know, with good links into the popular crowd. <laughs> And then you're going to the University of Washington you describe as predestined. Why was that? Oh, our family bleeds purple. <laughs> um, you know, my, my grandfather was the dean of the chemi chemical engineering department here at the U, and my, my dad graduated from medical sc school here at the U. Both my brothers went to the U. All my, all my uncles went to the University of Washington. I, I just kind of grew up immersed in it. I grew up about four miles away. Mm -hmm. So this university was a big part of my upbringing mm -hmm. as well. If you had it to do over, would you make the same decision? Yeah, absolutely. Would you? Yeah, I still bleed purple. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, absolutely. I think it's a great mm -hmm. university, and I really uh, enjoyed my time here. Mm -hmm. What was your major? Undergraduate was aeronautics and astronautics. Um, so I went into engineering and uh, for the undergraduate degree and came out the other end with that degree and an MBA. Mm -hmm. and, and then during your junior year, you were accepted to the aerospace engineering school, but during junior year, you made another decision. Can you tell us about that. Yeah, you know, I had kind of been heading towards engineering again, almost predestined. Um, you know, science and math was was something I was good at. I had lots of uncles, and my bro older brother was was an engineer. I, I, we mentioned my grandfather was the chemical the dean of the chemical engineering department, and I kind of just sort of walked that direction. And it was my junior year where I really started to realize, you know, I don't like this very much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm good enough at math and physics to to get through this, but I don't have a passion for it. And that's when I started to look at other things. And how did you find your way into business? Well, I knew I started taking some econ classes uh, using my electives to explore a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I realized that what I really wanted was to put an MBA on top of my engineering degree. Uh, I did some sort of informational interviewing around that. Um, mm -hmm. So I applied for, uh, took the GMAT and applied for the university's MBA school and was one of the, I think, four students that year accepted into the MBA program without any industry mm -hmm. experience and went straight through. Yeah, now that, that's kind of an interesting thing to do and something <coughs> that I always kind of caution my students against doing. Did you feel that you were kind of accepted by your peers since you didn't have any work experience? I was. I wouldn't recommend it either, um, realistically. And I have 
have uh, counseled friends and, mm -hmm. and people here at the U that you, know, you really need to go out and get some experience before you go back for that MBA. I, I believe I was accepted by an older crowd um, and still have friends uh, mm -hmm. from those days. Uh, but I think I would have taken a slightly different track with my studies in MBA school had I been out mm -hmm. in industry for a little while. Is there anything that you did to get accepted or did it just kind of fall into place? I think it fell into place. It was a combination of, you know, my, my engineering curriculum in undergrad, uh, you know, pretty good, uh, nice performance on the GMAT and, and the essays involved with mm -hmm. the application. In which business area did you decide to focus? Well, with the engineering degree, I, I kind of migrated towards operations management and accounting. Um, and that's why I say, had I do, had it do, to do over again, uh, I would go out in the industry because now I would probably take more of a marketing and now e-business mm -hmm. track now mm -hmm. that there's a program in the M MBA school that focuses on e-business. There wasn't yeah. at that time. Yeah. So you said that you would caution students against going yeah. directly. What would you encourage them to do? How many years out? Oh, I think three or four mm -hmm. at the minimum, mm -hmm. but I think three or four years out would be appropriate. Because I know my experience, if I were going to go straight through, I probably would have ended up going ahead in marketing, only to get out to realize that I just didn't like marketing that much for mm -hmm. me, and computers were what I was really interested in. So the two years off completely shifted my, right. my direction. Right. And I think there's also a tendency to follow what you did in your undergrad program yep. and just get deeper into it, and right. that's probably not exactly the, the best point. direction to that's go. That's exactly my point. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I followed a track that made sense for an engineer. Um, not necessarily one that made mm -hmm. sense for Steve. Right. You know, you're still trying to figure out who that was yeah. at that point. Right. What are some of the <clears throat> things that you did or didn't do to try and get the most out of your MBA? Well, I think I learned as much realistically from my peers as I did from the, from the classes themselves. I mean, sitting in that environment where you've got um, almost a melting pot of, of industries uh, and industry experience, um, I did sort of migrate and, my, you know, and hang out with, study with uh, a group that was you know, quite a bit older than me but had experiences that I was interested in. And, and so I, I think I, I learned a lot from my classmates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I would always tell my students is that you'll probably learn about a third from me, a third from each other, and a third from the guest lecturers, and that that's perfectly reasonable. Right. And then there's a bit from yourself that you kind of put into it. So your first job after your MBA was at Boeing, which you said was kind of another <coughs> foregone conclusion. Why was that? <clears throat> I would describe that almost as a self-fulfilling prophecy. Again, I had the engineering degree in the MBA. Uh, my undergrad was aerospace engineering. Boeing was a natural fit for me. Um, I still kind of had this underlying discontent um, mm -hmm. that I needed to, to stop and gut check where I was heading. And that's why I describe Boeing as a self-fulfilling prophecy because you know, I, I spent three years there and I, I learned a lot. And I, I would describe, I, I guess the way I would describe it is the first day I realized that Boeing was a really good experience for me was the first day I had left. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I could look back at what I had learned. Oh, the wonders of hindsight. Right. In which area did you work? I was in the military side, Boeing military airplanes. I worked, uh, helped designing uh, the, the bay doors for the B-2 bomber and then moved over to the F-22, which was still a, a mm -hmm. confidential program at that point in time. Had the top secret clearance. Uh, and all of that, and you know, I, uh, that was part of the reason I need, realized I needed to leave. Um, one day, I recognized that I was working on uh, the super plastic form titanium of the resting gear of the F-22. I was I was in the lab blowing things up and had this top secret clearance, and I thought this is the coolest job an aerospace engineer can mm -hmm. get, and I'm not happy. So something's got to give. Mm -hmm. Was that a hard decision to make? It, it was a really hard decision to make. I, 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 had, a, I had a midlife crisis in my middle 20s, <laughs> and I'm really glad I had it then. Um, and my does wife that mean was, there's room for another one, or does that mean I you got not. it out of the way? <laughs> I hope not. It was a tough decision because, you know, I put myself through college. I had a major financial investment. I had a major investment of, of, of my time in engineering. To, to walk away from that was a really, really hard thing mm -hmm. to do. And, uh, you know, you mentioned in the intro that I, I consider myself a bit of a risk taker. My wife is decidedly not a risk taker, and I knew it was time when she looked at me one day and went, you're not happy, mm -hmm. you need to quit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a risky thing. We had a mortgage, um, and, you know, it was, it was walking mm -hmm. out onto thin ice, but mm -hmm. that's what I did. So you just left. You didn't have another yeah, job. Yeah, I had a... On the side, I had been building a small business with an in, actually an inventor and uh, an investor, and I was b the business development, uh, the business person in this triumvirate, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a great experience. I, I wrote the business plan, I pitched it to other investors, um, and I really needed time to focus on that, and uh, so what I did, I, I left, you know, clean, 
to, to focus on that, but realized pretty quickly that I better, you know, have something to help pay that mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, and that's mm -hmm. when I ended up going to Autodesk. And what, what made you take that position? Well, Autodesk was a really great fit for me. If, if people don't know who Autodesk is, they're the, you know, they're the largest PC software company you might not have heard of. If, mm -hmm. if you've heard of AutoCAD, which is the, the dominant player in design automation for engineers and architects, that's Autodesk. So it was a really nice fit for me because you know that's I could speak to engineers and uh, I had been using Katia and CADM at, at Boeing. So if I was going to go to a software company, mm -hmm. couldn't have found a better one than Autodesk. But this wasn't a step up for you. No, absolutely not. Um, lots of lost sleep mm -hmm. for me in that in that case. I went into their tech support group uh, in Bothell. Uh, Autodesk had acquired uh, Generic Software, which was a company that had grown out of Bothell and uh, you know, quickly rose through the management ranks of Autodesk. And you know, a, a, a year later, I, I was on a nice mm -hmm. uh, software management track and, and real pleased with where it was heading. Yeah. But at the beginning, when you took that position, was that kind of hard on your ego? Because that was, yeah. I mean, not only not a step up, but it was quite a step down it in was. terms of level and salary and responsibility. Yeah, yeah it was. It was a, it was a big hit to the ego, and like mm -hmm. I said earlier, um, concern over you know making a change of this nature mm -hmm. uh, early in my career. But you know it worked out. Mm -hmm. You know one funny story I like to tell is uh, the first day, my first day outside of Boeing, um, I, on the side with a friend, I had been dabbling in some beer and wine making activities, <laughs> and and we had a, a batch of wine uh, ready to bottle, and we needed bottles. So the next day after my last day of Boeing as a design engineer on this F-22. I was rifling through a dumpster at the transfer <laughs> station for bottles, and uh, <laughs> this uh, not a good sign. I remember thinking to myself as I popped my head out of the dumpster, and there was a there was a class. Uh, a teacher was bringing a, a class of small kids through to uh, on a field trip, and I when I got the looks of okay, let's move along. <laughs> um, I thought to myself, wow, amazing what a day can do. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> so, no, oh, but that that's a tough decision to make. I ended up not doing that and at, at almost the same crossroad, although I think my career was probably five, five years beyond that, where I was at Ogilvy and Mather, I was in IT, I was not happy, and yeah. I've always liked writing. And I decided that I was going to try and see if I could get a position as a creative writer. Right. And I did one informational interview and realized that I would be managed by somebody about five to six years younger than I was who didn't know anything, like from my arrogant viewpoint, didn't know anything. And I knew I could probably get through the interview and convince them it would be okay, and I knew it would drive me nuts. Yeah. And I, I didn't do it and never followed that direction, which ended up fine, but it's always interesting to see two, two crossroads that are the same yeah. and different paths. And for you, it, it worked yeah, out beautifully. Yeah, it worked out really well for me. I mean, uh, and Autodesk couldn't have been a better place for me to go, not just because of the software they write, but also the culture of that company. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a lot of ways, I think the folks at Autodesk that I'm still friends with kind of gave me a do-over. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't get mulligans very often in life, <laughs> and I got one. You got one. Yeah. Um, what was your involvement in the development of the Golden Phone Award? Ooh, the Golden Phone Award. Trying to trying to remember that. Well, it was a tech support environment at mm -hmm. Autodesk that I was in, and uh, you know, it's a tough environment uh, being in tech support. I mean, it's it's a it's a heavy co duty call environment. You're usually talking to people that aren't so happy. And, yeah, the uh, happy ones don't call you just to chat. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, a couple of things that I really wanted to work at uh, while I was at Autodesk. One was um, sort of better integrating our tech support folks into the business planning, uh, the product planning. Uh, we were remote from, Auto Autodesk is based in Marin County, and we were remote from the development team. So really trying to become customer advocate and be a part of the mm -hmm. design process. The other was sort of, you know, really uh, recognition. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that we had a monthly uh, mm -hmm. award for these teams, and that was sort of the development of the Golden mm -hmm. Phone Award. And I, th I think the funny part of this, um, this is probably submitted to you by Evelyn, uh, Turner at Autodesk was, I, I sometimes have creative ideas that I struggle to fulfill because I very uh, I'm a lousy artist. Um, so I had several tries at trying to create the actual Golden Ford Phone Award that we were giving away, and those were disastrous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And didn't you end up gluing the trophy to your coffee uh, table? Yep. Yeah. That yep. happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how long were you in your original role there? The, the um, ego swallowing. Yeah, role. the ego swallowing role. Less than a year, mm -hmm. probably nine or ten months. 
Yeah. And I think you told me that talent plus drive equals opportunity. It does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you, you need both. Um, oftentimes, you really need more of the second, mm -hmm. just initiative and inertia. Um, you know, I think one of the, that's one of the reasons that was such an important move for me to leave Boeing in, in that environment, because for the rest of my career, I knew that regardless of what had happened, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I was going to be okay, you know, and I could find a, a, a great mm -hmm. environment for myself. I didn't need to rely on a company to give me security mm -hmm. to build my own. Yeah. But now, again, that you'd stepped away from Boeing, what was it that you saw about Boeing that you didn't appreciate while you were there? That I did not appreciate? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I mean, and I've spoken to Scott Griffin about this a couple of times or, or, and heard him talk about it. Boeing's such a, such a big place, and there's so many smart people that work there, so many cool projects to work on. Uh, you know, if, as you look at my career, uh, it became a somewhat transient high-tech career there through, through a period of five or six years. And, and really, I think the employee, an employee at Boeing has the ability to do that but stay within the confines of that company. Uh, I have a lot of friends that work there mm -hmm. that had very different experiences than I did mm -hmm. uh, and really are, are loyal and, and enjoy working at the, that company. So I think that's possibly mm -hmm. something that I would mention. The other thing, you know, I did get good experience in uh, what would become business development uh, activities for me later in my career. Um, you know, if I was successful at, Bo at Boeing, it was because I was, I was able to go into what they call a change committee in the engineering world there and, and really sort of uh, pitch, pitch these ideas and, and garner consensus on a, on a decision. And that's a pretty good experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially for someone that young. Right. That's a big deal. Right. So after a few years, what happened to your small business? Well, I'm convinced that there is a... Uh, a conspiracy between the U.S. Patent Office and the patent lawyers to, to, to run you broke in the process of achieving a patent. And that was really important to what we were doing. We, we had some, some, new, uh, some new art, but you know, after we went through three rounds of, of, of pay the piper when it came to uh, the legal fees, we just realized we couldn't continue. And so um, that's just sort of, like I said earlier, kind of it's something that ran its course over about 18 months. And when it washed away, I had you know, a whole new career track in the software world that mm -hmm. I was very excited about. But even though you were very happy at Autodesk for quite a while, you decided to leave after about three years. Right. What made you decide that that was the right time? I was at a crossroads at Autodesk. Um, I thought the natural progression from where I was in managing tech support uh, was into product management. Um, those roles would, would lead me physically to Marin County, and I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier I'm an arrogant Seattleite. Um, although Marin County is a beautiful place to live and my wife and I highly considered it. But the other thing going on at that time, um, having, having been on simultaneously three or four different product development teams at Autodesk, uh, I was watching how they were approaching this thing called the Internet. Um, Autodesk uh, works very closely with Microsoft and I was in meetings where the subject of the meeting went something like Microsoft's betting their company on the Internet. We need to figure out how we're going to bet our company on the Internet. And my reaction to that was, well, I don't have a company to bet on the Internet, but I have my time. And I was in this unique part of my career where my wife was working for Corbis Corporation. It's a Bill Gates-backed company. It was, it was a relatively stable job with great benefits, and we had no kids. So I could swing for the fence. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was when I decided, no, I'm going to stay in Seattle, and I'm going to find an Internet startup, and that's, mm -hmm. that's where I'm going to go. And what did you end up doing? Uh, I met Matt Highsmith, uh, who uh, people may remember uh, from his days at Attachmate, and uh, went to uh, uh, Intermine Corporation, which was uh, uh, a company that was, was developing some of the early push technology, if you remember that buzzword from mm -hmm. several years ago, and uh, went there as a product marketing manager. And Matt became sort of a mentor to you. Yeah, yeah, he did. I, I have mentors from each of my stops mm -hmm. along the way, and they're really important to me. Mm -hmm. um, I really, Matt was the type of person, type of business person in many ways, not just in talent, but in, in how he approached people that I wanted to be like. Uh, I really wanted to better understand how he got where, where he was at a mm -hmm. fairly young age, and, and he became an important, mm -hmm. important piece of my, of my mentor group. How, how did you use your mentor? I mean, did you use that in, in sort of a formal way, or was it an informal no. thing? Uh, no, it's an informal thing. The only formal, none, none of my mentors know how formal it is in my head. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's amazing to me that a lot of large companies have mentor programs, which I think are needed, but, it, but no individual needs that help. 
um, anybody with, you said talent and drive, anybody mm -hmm. with the drive part of that who, who wants to create a great set of mentors can go out and do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, uh, I really kind of use that group as almost my career board of directors. I'm the chairman mm -hmm. of that board, mm -hmm. uh, but each one of these uh, directors on my personal board is really important, and their input's important. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've, I, I've, I count five and sometimes six uh, folks in that group, and they've helped me not just make connections, which a lot of mentors do, networking, um, but really helped me uh, with tough decisions along the way. So you just sort of kept them in your personal loop? Yeah. Is that, so you made a concerted effort that I'm going to nurture this relationship. Right. It's right. not something that just happens organically, no. in a way. No. Yeah. So as a marketing manager, what did you do? What was your job? Well, my initial position, and anybody that's been in an internet startup knows that you, know, you wear lots of hats. Right. Uh, my initial position, as I recall, was to build uh, what we were calling the global directory, uh, really um, build out uh, web websites who were going to be using the Intermind technology, sort of build out the directory of those for our website so that users who had downloaded our software could subscribe to these websites and, and sort of build out um, almost the, the search capability and directory structure of those. That changed really fast. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, and I started taking on a lot more projects. And because I had gotten uh, to know Matt very well, and I think Garn, you know, won his trust, he started giving me lots of marketing projects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need this, we need this, we need that. So it became, it became uh, a lot of different things, including business development. You know, going into companies and and creating the bu that business partnership. Um, it was my first early days of, of, of contract negotiation, mm -hmm. et cetera. And what did you like and dislike about that position? Well, I, I, I loved the technology. Um, I loved being a part of, of mm -hmm. this just exploding market. Uh, I enjoyed the, uh, the structure of the, of the company in terms of not a lot of bureaucracy and uh, you know, the, the chance to do a lot of different really cool things all simultaneously. Um, I think to, to be successful in that environment, you have to obviously be okay with change. I mean, you need to show up, be able to show up one day and find out, okay, we're going a whole new direction. Forget everything that you were doing yesterday. And some people struggle with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't. Uh, I, I, I get excited about those things. So. so what did you dislike about the position? Anything? <clears throat> I can't say I disliked anything about the position, but it was uh, something that I would l learn a big lesson about in t uh, for my later experiences in my career. Um, you know, watching sort of the downfall of it. I mean, mm -hmm. we were trying to get the company acquired. We were trying to get, again, patents uh, through, which actually came through later. Um, and uh, sort of being there for the, for the downfall, uh, mm -hmm. not, not making it public and, see, and seeing our, 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 our vision played out. Um, that was a really hard time. Happened to, you know, let go of people, lay, lay people off, agonizing days at mm -hmm. that company. Yeah. And at what point did you decide it was time for you to leave? Well, we got down to about 10 people and uh, from, from uh, over about 130 at its largest, uh, largest point. And I realized where the company was heading wasn't somewhere I wanted, I wasn't going to learn much. Um, we, we were working hard on these patents. Our technology was already be in use by some, some large companies um, in the industry. And really, I think the way to profitability was going to be licensing that technology, and if not getting the, uh, the license, um, finding our way into a court to, mm -hmm. to get recourse for that. And I think that might have been a, a good strategy to, to help the investors um, get a return on their money, but it wasn't something that I was going to be happy doing, and it certainly wasn't anything I was going to learn much uh, mm -hmm. in the process of doing it. That's when I knew it was time mm -hmm. to go. So you sort of left before it was over. I did. Was that emotionally difficult to leave before it was over, or was <coughs> it just emotionally difficult to recognize that it was over? I'd say uh, the, the latter, mm -hmm. uh, the recognition and, and, and going through that process. It wasn't emotionally difficult for me to leave. Um, you know, again, back to leaving Boeing, um, uh, it was something, you know, it, this was a progression for me, and, uh, you know, I knew, it, I knew that I was going to find, find good things out there. Yeah. I think sometimes when you're in a company that's that small, you get so personally connected yes. to it that you, you, know, you feel like you're letting people down right. when you decide that you need to go and leave and do, and do something else. And you're, it's almost like letting down family, even though it's, quote unquote, just a job. Right. I, I agree with that. Doesn't feel like just a job. No. <laughs> yeah. So then what made the job at AT&T Wireless appealing? 
I was watching these companies go public and have these ridiculous valua uh, valuations. And, you know, this is, I guess, the 97, 98 time frame. <clears throat> I thought the, the business to consumer internet market was going to play out pretty quickly. And I realistically thought, you know, the, the, so the, the entrenched suppliers have, have a lot of uh, strength in these, in these verticals. They're going to figure this out. And uh, the stock market's going to figure out how to value these companies. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed looking at the valuations when they were irrational. And uh, so I thought to myself, you know, where is the next valuation in the ether going to be? And, mm -hmm. and wireless data seemed like that place. Um, AT&T was just developing PocketNet, which was really, really early and innovative uh, inter wireless internet services. And I joined a group called the Wireless Data Division, which w was like a small company within AT&T Wireless. Um, it was separate from sort of the, the voice world of the company. Uh, it was like a startup within a large company. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, you know, it was a culture and environment that I thought I could learn a lot. Did you decide to pursue AT&T Wireless, or were they just one of the people who happened to be hiring and you thought about all the different directions <coughs> and thought that was the one for you? They, were hi they did happen to be hiring, but it was something I pursued. And this is mm -hmm. back to, to my MBA uh, days. I actually had some contacts within the wireless data group at AT&T Wireless. Um, so networking coming back to, to being really mm -hmm. important. And uh, so it was, it was a company that was high on my list. Um, and then the wireless data division within it uh, mm -hmm. was a really good fit for me. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of this informal inner structure with a more formal outer structure. Yeah, I mean, it, it was sort of have our cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, almost the prestige and if, you know, somewhat to a certain degree security of the mm -hmm. large corporation, but the, the chance right. to work within a real entrepreneurial mm -hmm. group inside that company. And what was the scope of your responsibility? I came there as the uh, as the developers pro managing the developers program. Um, AT and T was AT and T Wireless, I should say, was uh, developing PocketNet as a platform for uh, for internet for companies and uh, websites to really develop upon for the wireless devices. And so I managed the developers program, which was uh, you know sort of inviting, recruiting software companies in. And providing them with handsets and data service um, and also technical support along the way. That changed pretty quickly. Uh, I took on business development as well, which, which was a great experience mm -hmm. for me. I mean, we developed developing relationships with Lotus and Novell, mm -hmm. um, we, you know, doing the first wireless enablement of notes, um, spending a lot of time in Cambridge with that Lotus team, working on those contracts. That was where I started to get my sort of associate's degree, law degree that mm -hmm. every business developer needs. Um, and then I took on a third piece, uh, uh, also in, a content, in the content management. So I managed all the relationships with the ESPNs and Bloombergs mm -hmm. and weather channels of the world that were in our home deck mm -hmm. on PocketNet. So really, I came in with one position, and a um, short time later, really had what, you, what had been three mm -hmm. positions, yeah. but they were all very similar. And it also looks like all of your business development experience, which may have been sort of small then, at least kind of gave you a beginning. You weren't just starting business development no. from scratch as a skill set. No. Uh -uh. But this job that turned started out great turned not so great pretty quickly. What happened? It did. Um, well, a couple things happened. One, one of my uh, mentors on the board of directors, Charlie Gillette, the, the guy that hired me, left to start his own company. Um, and then, you know, we were, in my eyes, we were a victim of our success. We had developed this program uh, fairly well. The technology was, was great. And it was time for the company to sort of to, to bring that technology more in line with its flagship offering, digital P, you know, PCS. And uh, so we were, we were sort of morphed into the AT&T wireless uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that started to scare me a little bit. I mean, I, I, I liked working for the smaller uh, company that we had. Um, it was clear to me that decisions there were based more on selling minutes mm -hmm. than building out uh, what could really be a, a, a killer technology for this company. And so that's when I first started to get a little nervous about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I realized, you know, I'm not sure I want to work for, for the phone company. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, there was also trade winds of, of AT&T mothership from New Jersey sort of taking over more of a role as well. Now, that didn't end up happening. AT&T Wireless went public on its own um, a couple of years after that. but. That was certainly something that wasn't going to be mm -hmm. interesting to me. So it just kind of got your radar up, saying right. this is 
not that I'm not unhappy now, but right. I can foresee a time when I'm going to be unhappy yeah. and I don't want to get there. Yeah. The other thing going on was I mentioned I was working with these with a lot of developers and the content managing the content relationships and my my uh, foreseeing that the business and consumer market was going to was, was going to be played out quickly mm -hmm. wasn't hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. um, so I was I was AT&T Wireless's uh, uh, business partner of all of these companies that were just achieving unbelievable success, and you know I, it was time for me to go out and go after that again. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I was really ready to to go back to the startup world and and again mm -hmm. swing for the fence. Mm -hmm. Did you have a position when you left? I did. You did. And yeah. what was that position? Uh, I went to Destinations.com at this point, which was a startup company in Seattle um, that was uh, going after the travel segment, really more the leisure travel segment. Um, didn't know a whole lot about that, about that <laughs> vertical, uh, other than it was achieving huge early success. And so I, I, I became the uh, director of business development and then very quickly the, the vice president of business development and acquisitions at, at that company. Mm -hmm. And how did you get connected with them? Well, another key person mm -hmm. along the way for me, Todd Tarbert, um, actually a college uh, fraternity brother of mine, although he's old, he was out of college by the time I, I, I entered, um, just a, a guy that I always respected. Um, he, he was an attorney that had, well, he calls himself a, a, a recovering attorney um, <laughs> that had decided to go back into the business world himself. Mm -hmm. um, and so he recruited me away. Mm -hmm. Did he know you from before? Just really more as an acquaintance mm -hmm. than anything else. So you had met before. We had met several times, at that point. but I got alumni functions yeah, or exactly things like that. Right. Okay. No, he knew who I was, mm -hmm. uh, but I can't say that we were really close other mm -hmm. than that. And what was your role starting there? Um, business development, um, really sort of managing the. the we had several uh, consumer websites, mm -hmm. which was probably the first problem. Um, and uh, I really needed to manage the, not advertising, but business partnerships mm -hmm. um, and build the, the visitorship to that site, um, build the traffic. Mm -hmm. Now, in a sense, you went from having three sort of different roles where business development was one of them right. to this role where business development was the whole thing. Yep. From the outside looking in, it could almost look like a step back, but it really wasn't. No. Can you kind of talk about how all business development is not equal and Absolutely. job titles and... Yeah, absolutely. You know, I had I had gotten I had gotten a range of business development experiences from the small company who doesn't have a brand who who furiously needs to to get one um, to the AT and T wireless side where it's a completely different uh, it's a completely different effort because at that point in time you're the you're the big logo uh, mm -hmm. you have all the leverage and what you need to do is better manage the resources that are gonna that are gonna get devoted to a relationship that you start to build those being legal and marketing resources uh, and accounting. Um, so they're very different. One of them is very sales oriented, I think, uh, where you know you need to get in there and, and make a pitch that this big company will believe, and the other is is isn't at all that way. It's making good decisions and trying trying to separate uh, the facts from facts from the sales pitch. Um, going into destinations.com, you know, they did, when I got there, we didn't even have the website uh, under that domain name, so we had no no name at all. Uh, we had some pretty interesting uh, technology, and we were supported by some good product. But uh, so I, I would say, that, you know, this was a step up for me, um, particularly as it moved into the VP role and I mm -hmm. got into the acquisitions piece of it, which, which was really at uh, Todd's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with Todd's help, yeah. um, and I learned a lot from him, and I learned a lot in that position. Mm -hmm. What did you do in the acquisition side of it? Well, we were at first we were the the acquirer and we made a couple uh, of acquisitions and then we were uh, flirting for several months again uh, up until I left with being the acquired mm -hmm. um, and so that was uh, we, we were trying to go after uh, t to secure inventory really to sell on the travel website and uh, we were looking at small tour operators um, uh, to, to acquire those companies so it was a lot of uh, looking through the due diligence and, again, leaning on this sort of uh, associate law degree that I claim to have. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you become <clears throat> sort of an expert in this part of the field, in, the, in that vertical, if you will, in that space? How, how, how do you kind of get, get your arms wrapped around something? Do you do a lot of reading? Do you talk to people? How yeah. do you learn? Um, both. A lot of I, I did a lot of web surfing. I did a lot of just talking to, to folks in the industry. Um, it's travel is a huge industry, but it's surprising how how 
how small it feels once you get into it mm -hmm. um, in terms of knowing who my counterparts were at, at uh, every other internet travel internet site going and and better understanding the supplier relationships uh, travel's an interesting uh, distribution uh, situation and, and getting to know that quickly was was job one for me mm -hmm. um, so you know I would say you know a lot of reading and, and a lot of sort of uh, uh, inter informational interviews almost mm -hmm. and talking around the industry, going to the right uh, trade shows and seminars, et cetera. Did your MBA have anything to do in teaching you how you learn? Yeah, I would say, I would say my whole college uh, career did. Um, I, I'm not one that, well, in college, particularly on the undergraduate side, I was a crammer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, I was short-term memory, <laughs> and uh, you know, I think I, I, I got better in getting into business school at, at getting away from doing that. But still, you know, um, I'll prep for conversations, you know, uh, day of or, or or the day before. I'm not someone that does can has the patience, I think, to sit around mm -hmm. and do a lot of offline research. Um, so I think, um, and I also I, I think learn a lot more face to face and getting in and introducing mm -hmm. myself to people than I do trying to. Yeah. to do the research. Yeah, because that's one of the things I learned about myself, and I think I learned it in my MBA, and it's, it's kind of served, knowing that has served me well, is that I don't learn by reading. It's just not my best tool, which seems kind of odd, but yeah. I, I just don't. I tend to learn best by talking to people and then reading for depth, and talking to people and reading for depth. I just can't sit down and read a manual. I can't sit down yep. and just do the research, and learning that saved me a lot of time. Because right. I didn't spend a week trying to figure it out that way, only to realize that I've got all these stacks of books I think I've read and I know nothing. Yeah, I'm, I'm very similar. And our mm -hmm. usability uh, expert at alaskair.com would, would tell you so <laughs> because I don't read stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm probably the typical user, but you know, I yeah. don't read the instructions. I just I go for the buttons on this website. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, it frustrates her because I don't I mm -hmm. oftentimes uh, see the intent of the usability studies, but that's yeah. who I am. But that's why you're there, right. in a sense. Right. So you were very excited about this, this new position in this new company, and when did you realize that it just wasn't going to happen? Well, I, I knew we were in good shape. I mean, I, I knew that the company's technology uh, was 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 fairly solid, and and uh, um, but again, we were moving towards uh, a be acquired role, and, and I th I, that's when I think I knew it was time for me to get to to get on. And you know, my intermine experience had led me to uh, not become so emotionally attached to this company where it was like, if this company doesn't make it, it's gonna be like my first dog just got run over by a car, mm -hmm. you know. It, uh, going through the Intermine experience and being fairly emotionally attached and, and struggling with, like I spoke, said earlier, the downfall of that, I went into this one with a completely different mm -hmm. mode. Um, it doesn't, I think you can be passionate and, and, uh, and totally involved in a company, but, but go home at night and not feel like you know, it's your it's your baby, mm -hmm. and it was interesting for me to watch um, because yeah. there was a whole lot of the of the employees at Destinations.com where it was their first time around, right? And they were going through what I did mm -hmm. it had gone through at Intermind, and those on my team I was counseling mm -hmm. along the way mm -hmm. uh, to 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 not feel that way. Yeah. And if this company doesn't make it, you know, you don't need to mm -hmm. think of it as the greatest personal right. failure of your right. life. Right. Right. I think it's very hard to separate those things, especially in those small startup situations because right. you do get so intensely involved and spend lots of hours. Yes, you do. It does not feel like a job. It sort of feels like a life. Yep. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's a large part of who you are. Now, I think that's important, at least the way the person, mm -hmm. type of person I am, my, my company needs to really be kind of a part, big part of who I am. Um, so I, I think it is important for that to, to feel that passion and connection. But I, I went into this second startup with such a different mm -hmm. rational Mm -hmm. expectation and I better understood the funding and how many rounds this company mm -hmm. had been through and what the investors had in it and, and uh, what their options were where I you know mm -hmm. I went into the inner mic situation completely yeah. blind of that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it has helped me big time in my days at Alaska Airlines because <laughs> now I talk to a lot of these companies mm -hmm. and I know exactly the questions to ask yep. uh, in terms of mm -hmm. you know how well companies funded and who's on their mm -hmm. board and who's who their VC mm -hmm. is and etc. Yeah, I think there aren't a lot of advantages with getting older, but the wisdom is certainly one of them. And just to be able to see the situation and be able to read it because you've been there before. Right. And know how to kind of manage your emotions and manage the connections and right. just how to do that.
So you were at Boeing for three years, you were at Autodesk for yeah. about three years, and then you were at Intermind, AT&T Wireless, <laughs> and Destinations.com for, yeah. count them, one That's year right. each. Did you start to worry about how your resume was going to read? I did. You know, and this is where my, uh, my board of directors came in. Mm -hmm. um, and I had mixed results, mixed reviews from, from that group. Uh, and I think it's important when you're looking at, at mentors to get ones that are going to give you the straight scoop on how they feel. Mm -hmm. You don't want a bunch of people that are going to say, yes, that sounds great. Right. And Evelyn, actually, from Autodesk was one that really, I, I knew from working with her for three years that she was very wary of people that had a background like mine mm -hmm. on paper. Um, I had great, uh, I had great, if you, if you talk through my career, it, it makes sense, and I had good answers for all of those questions. But on paper, it was mm -hmm. like. Yeah. You need to get to the point where someone will ask you those exactly. questions. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, John Kelly, when, uh, you know, our, our chairman, when I sat down with him, the first thing he said to me, and I think he wanted to throw me off, was, I can't hire you. You're going to get bored and leave in two years. Mm -hmm. Now, he, this was how he opened the interview. And, uh, so it puts you, know, you right on the defensive. Exactly. Um, and, you know, fortunately, my career, as we walked through it, made sense. Mm -hmm. But on paper, I was definitely concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of my first early bosses at Chemical Bank asked me if I had a seven-month turnaround because I had just had that circumstance with two jobs before that. Right. And it was just sort of a fluke. I think, though, early in, a career, in, in your career, it, I, I wouldn't have done it any differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the range of experiences, you know, I, I showed up um, when the Alaska opportunity came around with a really unique mm -hmm. uh, skill set that was very well suited for what, the, that, what they wanted. Um, you know, the, the, the software development, the internet marketing experience, the wireless piece, which was uh, definitely around the corner, still around the corner. <laughs> and uh, then Always the focus, out of reach. Right. Then the focus on travel mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and an understanding of that distribution channel. Um, it was it was it was something that was quite unique, I think, to a uh, quite unique match to this opportunity. So when you took this position, you sort of described yourself as being at another crossroads. Why why was that when you took the Alaska Air position? Yeah, well, there was there was some things going on in my personal life as well that made Alaska such a great fit for me. I had mentioned that my wife was was uh, sort of taking had the benefit laden position that was mm -hmm. fairly secure. And I was out swinging for the fence, and, and uh, we had started a family, and, uh, you know, our priorities were changing. You know, I felt when I was out there swinging for the fence, like, you know, I had this burning desire to be retired when I was 40, uh, like all these people that mm -hmm. I'd heard about. And uh, I was really, when I became a father, I was just, my whole agenda was changing. And I really wanted to get into a situation, well, it's time for me to quit swinging for the fence and start hitting some doubles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Karen wanted to, you know, uh, spend more time with our son and, and I think had always wanted to, to be in, uh, you know, at home when he was growing up. And so it was, it was a nice fit in that way, too. Mm -hmm. It was time for me to, uh, to get out of the, the dot-com yeah. area. Get a real job. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what is your role at Alaska Airlines? Well, I, I run the e-commerce e division. It's actually a division within marketing and planning. Um, and, you know, Alaska was first at a lot of things. And I, they were, if not the first, one of the first to, to dedicate a, a division to e-commerce. Mm -hmm. didn't, they didn't talk a lot about it. Um, you know, United and, and America West, I recall, very shortly after uh, Alaska had uh, created this division, did the same, and, and made a lot of noise mm -hmm. about it. Um, uh, my responsibility is to, you know, manage Alaska and HorizonAir.com. Um, really, our overarching uh, statistic, our overarching goal is, is the percentage of revenue of Air Group, Alaska and Horizon Revenue, we book on our website. But we've really taken a very different approach um, and, and become much more than that. Uh, really what we want to become is, is, the, is the preferred and best and easiest way to interact with our airline, mm -hmm. not just for buying your ticket. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the services we've developed, some in-house and some out-house out with some partners, um, really take the traveler from planning to all the way to day of flight mm -hmm. um, and, and try to develop services around that. What are some of your proudest accomplishments since joining the company in 99? I would say definitely the team, um, the team, the team we have, the culture we have. I, you know, I went into, I went into this environment, and these people didn't know me at all. And what I was really telling the group and, and trying to deliver on was, you know, we want we want to create an AlaskaAir.com incorporated mm -hmm. feel. I, I, you know, I had seen this small company within the company be such a great place to an exciting place to work, and it really had the same thing at Autodesk because we were. We, we were remote from headquarters there, and uh, 
I, I wanted to develop a business plan that brought a return to the company, get, get the group thinking in that way, um, thinking uh, the return on the investment. The, the company's making a bet on us, mm -hmm. and l let's almost treat them like our internal VCs mm -hmm. and, and deliver them a return each quarter and each year on that investment. So I think um, getting away from thinking purely uh, bits and bytes and thinking more about, you know, what's our, who are we? Right. You know, what's our brand? What's our mm -hmm. business plan? What are the metrics that mm -hmm. we need to put in place to see if we're succeeding or not? I, I think that more than yeah. anything, that's what it brought to it, to the table. And in a way, this was your first time kind of running your own yeah. show. Which, yeah. But which you were so well prepared for it. I, I, I'd like to think I, <laughs> I am. Um, and it's just been an absolute thrill. Mm -hmm. um, I, I work with great people. We have such a large and loyal customer base. We're developing really exciting services that are used by millions mm -hmm. of people. Uh, which is which is just a thrill, um, and again, I think the team, the people I work with, is is a really huge part of that. And uh, you know, building that right team, uh, particularly mm -hmm. on the marketing side, we had a fairly large development team, but we didn't have uh, the merchandising, the project management, the marketing management uh, personnel that we have in place now, and got some really great people. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we see as consumers that almost didn't happen? Yeah, um, I'd say a couple of things. I mean, we're the first uh, carrier in the world to, to d deliver web check-in, which is the ability to check in for your flight from your home or office and print your, your uh, boarding pass from home. Uh, you know, a large part of that, of that effort was done by an individual that, that has, has left our company. But, you know, I, that was something that you know, mm -hmm. he and then I inherited, and so we had to really continue to work with the FAA and, and uh, the airports and, and such um, on closely. Um, it was something that uh, I think a lot of internal people of the company didn't understand why we were doing mm -hmm. it. Um, so it was really a need to stick to the, keep the vision and stick with it. Mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would point out that one. Yeah. When you and I were involved in the University of Washington's e-business program last year and it's in its first year, one of the things that we talked a lot about was whether e-business needed special recognition or whether it was just going to become part of business as usual. Where do you see the trend going and where are we on that path? I, I, it probably varies from industry to industry. Um, E-commerce and e-business is just mainstream in the airline industry. Um, you know, it's, it may be amazing to the, on the outside for, for people to see these sort of what are stereotypically large behemoth bureaucratic organizations called airlines embrace and be really successful in e-commerce. Mm -hmm. um, but we've come a long ways and if, if you look through the, um, the distribution arrangements and travel you'll see that there's a lot of good reason for being aggressive in this area. So I'd say that we're fairly well along the way. However, I wouldn't say it's sort of a general part of e-business yet and that may be one of the reasons that Alaska need, decided it wanted to, to create its own division. Um, so that so that you know the the rules and the boundaries would be tested, and and perhaps why they wanted to bring someone from the outside in to run it that mm -hmm. that didn't have years of of uh, uh, airline distribution um, sort of pr uh, yeah. predisposed to the to the rules that had been built over decades. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't Break have a bias, mold. you don't have to undo it. Right. Yeah. What parts of your job come easily, and which parts are a stretch? Um. Well. The business development that I do mm -hmm. is something that's real second nature to me. Um, the strategic planning I, I enjoy, and because I, I think I have a good mix now of, of, of travel industry experience and, and internet experience, I, I feel like we're being fairly innovative in our not just our website but our relationships with, with the agency community. Um, on the tough side. Um, well, we, we have to deal with quite a bit of channel conflict in what we do um, with the traditional travel agency world as well as internally to, um, to our employees. And that's a tough one, I think, um, to, to handle that in, in the right way, uh, to continue to do what I was hired to do, um, but continue to have good, solid relationships with you know, uh, our reservations office and mm -hmm. with the travel agency community. That's something that... Um, I don't mind doing, but it's a challenge, and it's always there. And at times, it feels like it's taking you away from your from your focus mm -hmm. um, to deal with those issues. But they they need to be handled really, you know, really carefully. How would you describe your management style? Um, hire good people and let them work. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I'd like to think I'm not a micromanager. Um, 
you know, I, I think I learned, I learned a lot at Autodesk. That was an environment where I had, you know, fairly production, you know, frontline call center environment. Um, personnel issues were, were not, uh, were, were needed to be handled in the right way. And I think I started to better understand what Autodesk uh, describes as behavioral management. Um, you know, everybody's different and they have different, uh, different areas where they're comfortable and some areas where they need help and I think working with people to, 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 to see if not ask and find out what those areas are giving them the support they need where, where they feel like they, they need at least your trust and, and to bounce ideas off you and making sure that they uh, on the areas where you know that they're competent that they don't mm -hmm. they, they don't need to come to you mm -hmm. is really important so I mean being able to look at an employee when they ask you a question and say why did you ask me that Mm -hmm. You don't need my help with mm -hmm. that decision. Um, I think is, is is a really important part of, of, of my style. Um, you know, I, I focus in this on this in this job a lot on sort of our internal internal culture. Um, you know, trying to make sure that our development team is engaged in our business plan. Mm -hmm. You know, these are really really smart developers that we have working on what we do, and they they surf the web as much as the marketing group does, and so making sure that they're sort of engaged and and uh, and bought into not just the plan but the metrics we're signing up for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to a negotiation between me and my boss in terms of right. what that what those metrics are. But you know, if we've done a good job that mm -hmm. um, in in scripting them, then then the developers really feel like they're a part of that and are. Yeah. Actually. Are you a better manager or a leader? I'd say probably I'd say I'm probably a better leader than a manager. Why is that? Um I, I, I think again the the team building part uh, which I brought up several times is something that I've focused on in my career. I want something I wanted to get good at um and is is something I, I I'm proud of proud of. Uh, I know that employees that, that don't even report to me from the development team that have approached me and, and are thrilled to be working in the mm -hmm. group and feel energized, I, I think that's leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that over sort of straight personnel management is, is something that I've taken more to. What are some of the skills that you think are important for a successful IT career now? Well, you know, we talked, we've talked about this in the curriculum for the e-business track, and it's so hard to teach the, the soft skills, but mm -hmm. that's, that's where it is, you know. At the end of the day, it's people and your relationships and your ability to handle issues respectfully and, and positively. Um, it, naturally, in companies like ours, and it's talked about a lot in the press, there's the IT, sort of IT marketing mm -hmm. uh, friction. Um, Which can sometimes be very healthy. It can. If, if, if there's someone in place to, to, right. to, to build that culture and make sure right. that we're talking about issues, not people, and not mm -hmm. personalities, um, to, to add some humor to that situation if it, if it would help. Um, but without a good relationship between IT and marketing, you know, you're in for some huge issues with, mm -hmm. and the way I describe it is marketing's out promising things that IT can't deliver and or IT is promising to give marketing what it wants in 40 years. Right. And uh, neither one of those will work. Mm -hmm. So we're happy to be co-located with our development team, which really helps. Yeah. Uh, this AlaskaAir.com Air, incorporated uh, little company uh, works when we're all co-located and working together. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, it's those people skills yeah. and, and uh, relationship building. It's amazing how proximity makes such a difference. Yeah. Without it, you just really reinforce that us against them thing. Right. It's important. You know, another thing Alaska's done well, um, and I hand it to, to John and, and uh, the top executives and Bill and the top ex executives of the company, um, not just the co-location of our marketing and development team, but also we have something called the Tech Committee uh, that meets once a month, and it's, it's you know, the four senior VPs and, and our chairman and our president and me. And really mm -hmm. what it does is allows us to talk about Techno technology issues in sort of a, a, a almost a non-threatening way. One of the things I've read about is the marketing guy always seems to have the chairman's ear, but the IT manager doesn't, mm -hmm. and and inherits these, you know, these these marching orders that may not be deliverable. And that environment allows both uh, IT and marketing mm -hmm. to share the chairman's ear at the mm -hmm. same time, and walk out with a common understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I was reading in, in CIO about uh, the IT marketing uh, f uh, uh, frustration. Uh, several weeks ago, and all of the recommendations they had, I noticed Alaska Airlines had had actually done. 
and I don't know if it's because they did the research or they just it was just mm -hmm. intuition at, at the executive level but yeah. so it's a real great environment you've made a very strong commitment to give back to the University of Washington why is right. that so important to you well I bleed purple <laughs> <laughs> as part of it but no you know um, I know what it feels like to and we've talked through my career to to be working really hard to, to figure out where I want to go and I was really lucky to have some great people that helped me along the way um, somebody one of one of my mentors somewhere along the way said you know it's amazing that most people most human pe beings want really want to help <laughs> if if it's not too time-consuming or threatening in any kind of way and really when it comes down to it human nature is people like to talk about themselves mm -hmm. you know, this is being a good example and uh, <laughs> so you know the informational interview uh, process that I went through and the mentors that I had um, was, was really important to helping me figure out where I wanted to go. And so to come back to an environment where there's a lot of people in MBA school that are leaving one career and going into a different one um, that really just want to find out what you did or mm -hmm. what, what, what's your job like. Mm -hmm. um, the other reason is a selfish one, and, and that is, um, you know, we, we wanted, I want to be connected to the e-business track and the MBA track for recruiting purposes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also have a relationship now with uh, Highline Community College, who has a, who's an interactive media group, um, mm -hmm. which is also a, a set of students that are coming right. out with a very relevant skill set. So for me to be connected um, to these different programs that are local to me mm -hmm. uh, is a good thing. And also, I, you know, the other, my peers on the e-business uh, advisory mm -hmm. board are, are a great uh, yeah. network and sort of birds of a feather mm -hmm. discussion, if nothing yeah. else but to commiserate <laughs> that we all have the same issues. Truly. So... We'll take questions from the audience right after this break. The University of Washington Business School, located in Seattle, Washington, ranks among the top business schools in the United States. Information Technology Leaders is one of the many ways the UW Business School forges partnerships and reaches out beyond the university. For more information about the University of Washington Business School or Information Technology Leaders, visit informationtechnologyleaders.com. I know uh, many people at Boeing and with aeronautical engineering degrees and of course at Alaska Airlines are airplane nuts, but I didn't hear you talk about uh, being an airplane nut or being a pilot. That's, that's an astute observation. <laughs> and that's why I think the fact I'm in travel and working for an airline and have an aeronautical engineering degree um, that particular piece of my career may be more coincidence than grand design. You know, I, when I left the Boeing company, I was, I was leaving the aerospace industry um, to become an internet, uh, to eventually become an internet guy. And so then mig migrating to the dominant number one segment of e-commerce was a natural fit. I mean, travel is by far the number one segment in e-commerce. Uh, so no, I never was an airplane nut. Um, you know, I, I migrated towards aerospace engineering because Engin aerospace engineers make a lot of money, and the University of Washington had one of the best programs in the world in, in that area. I'm trying to get my son to be an airplane nut, though. <laughs> Pilots make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Bet. I'd like to close with a composite quote from several of the people that Steve works with. Steve offers a high level of energy and a very balanced temperament. He's a great leader who provides guidance and direction, but gives his people flexibility in the room to get the job done. He's a wonderful communicator who challenges people to not only define their goals, but to also articulate ways to achieve those goals. Steve has the ability to see the connections between all aspects of the business. He can understand strategic corporate issues, but never loses sight of the customer buying a ticket or an employee who needs a nudge back in the right direction. But the thing I admire most about Steve is how he's remained grounded. He has succeeded with so many opportunities, but has done so without becoming arrogant. He continues to be a caring, respectful, and patient manager.